If you're new with us, we're in the middle of a two-part sermon series uh, now that we're calling Faith Going Forth, which is taking us uh, through the books of First and uh, later Second Thessalonians. And through this series, we've been talking about asking the question, what can it look like for us both as individuals and as a, as a church to be what we're calling a gospel wellspring, which is something that we... we that phrase that we use to describe a people who are a continual source of supply of the hope and truth of the gospel in all of life. And so we're looking at the church in Thessalonica as, as an example in the ways that they were living, the ways they were serving, the ways they were learning to see how faith was going forth into these various dimensions of their lives so we can see how faith should go forth into every dimension in our lives, how the truth of the gospel should impact how we live so that God can be so at work through us that we can share the truth and the hope of the gospel with others as well, with our community. And so in our time in 1 Thessalonians so far, we've looked at these various dimensions of our lives to see how the gospel uh, can impact us and should form us in these different areas. So we looked at things like our relationships, our understanding of God's word, that it truly is the very word of God. We've talked about our sexual morality, Right? We've talked about our work, how the gospel impacts how we approach our, our work. We've talked about how uh, the gospel informs our grief. We've talked about how it informs our endurance through suffering, how it helps us walk through hard uh, times in life. And we've also talked about how we can live today with hope, knowing that Jesus is coming again, living in light of the return of Jesus. And so in our next few weeks, as we continue in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, we're going to continue to look at additional dimensions of of, of our lives, of how the gospel can uh, teach us and inform us. But in the next few weeks, we're going to look not so much at dimensions of our individual lives, but of our life as the church. And how does the gospel impact us as a church And so today we're going to look at this kind of key relationship between a church and its leaders. And the next Sunday we're going to look at this relationship between the church and each one of us. So a congregation and each of its members to one another. And then after that we're going to swing back around and we're going to talk again about this key relationship, the central relationship of our vertical relationship between us and God. And so that's going to take us through August. That'll wrap up our first part of our series through 1 Thessalonians. And then uh, in our fall launch, we'll launch into the second part of this series into 2 uh, Thessalonians. And my hope, again, over these next few weeks is that we can understand what it means for us to be a healthy church. Okay, as we look at these key relationships, what does it mean for us as Rock Haven to be a healthy church and understand how that health and faithfulness plays out in each of these key relationships relationships. And so if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you need a Bible, we have Bibles in the back corner on the back wall. You're welcome to use one of those. If you need a Bible, you can take one of those and keep it as a gift. Um, If you're using one of those, we're on page uh, 1174 in those blue Bibles. And we're going to be in just in verses 12 and 13. We're just going to look at two verses today. Verses 12 and 13 of 1 Thessalonians 5. And we'll have the words up on the, on the screens as well. So 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 and 13. The Word of God says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. This is the Word of God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come to this time of worshiping through your word together, we ask for your help. We ask for your spirit to lead us, to guide us, open our hearts, open our minds, uh, to see wondrous things out of your word here today. Help us to understand where we need to grow, where we need to learn, how we need to ever draw closer to you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you think of some of the major institutions in the United States today, you think of like the Supreme Court, you think of Congress, the presidency, you know, banks, big businesses, public schools even, for each one of those institutions that I listed, the level of trust of the American people, the confidence of the American people in those institutions is less than half 
today of what it was back in the 1970s. Okay, if you think about that, we're talking about the 1970s here. I mean, you're coming off the, the Watergate scandal, you know, at the end of the Vietnam War. I mean, we're talking about the days of disco music, for Pete's sake. People were more trusting in the days of disco music than they are today. I mean, it's kind of crazy to think about, but that's kind of where we're at. There's just not a high level of trust today between uh, the American people and these institutions that are meant to kind of be our leaders. And actually, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to point at all these other institutions, but that's, sadly, that's no different for the church. It's no different for the church. Back in 1975, about two-thirds of the country, actually over two-thirds of the country, trusted the church to do what the church was supposed to do. Two-thirds, the, the American people trusted, two-thirds of the American people trusted the church. Today, that's actually flipped. Two-thirds of the country don't trust the church now to do what the church is supposed to do. Now, you know, if we think about that, if we talk through this idea of trust, we have to keep in mind that, that trust is essential to any healthy relationship. It's incredibly difficult to respect and maintain a healthy relationship with someone if you don't trust them, if that trust isn't there. And so over these years, these decades of this declining levels of trust, we can look at the church, we can look inward, and we can see too many pastors, too many leaders have sadly contributed to these decreasing levels of trust and confidence because of unbelievable examples of abuse, of greed, of a lack of faithfulness to God's word. They've done a lot to break the trust of the people they're supposed to be shepherding and leading into a deeper relationship with Jesus. But we also see how with the church, the door swings both ways. While there are many stories of a pastoral abuse and scandal, there are also far too many examples of congregations who unfairly treated faithful pastors who were only trying to love and serve out their calling that God had for them. In fact, we've seen this kind of accelerate and expand in the last few years through COVID, where we've seen uh, different surveys, but one survey I saw said about 40% of pastors over the past few years have given serious consideration to just getting out of ministry, just being being done. And so we can see, if we understand that that's kind of the environment that we're living in today, where there are so many factors working to undermine this key relationship between the people of the church and its leaders, the question we need to ask then is, how can we instead do this differently? How can we instead foster a healthy, mutually uplifting relationship between a church and its leaders. How can we do that to protect and grow the health of our church? Okay, because I think we, we would all agree, we all long to be part of a healthy, growing, thriving church, don't we? Paul's instructions in this passage are meant to give us clarity about each of our roles in that. How can we each contribute to being part of a healthy church? And so the main point I want us to see today as we walk through our passage is that a healthy church needs faithful leaders. It needs to start with faithful leaders who are then respected and loved by the church. And so we're going to see how this is a mutually uplifting relationship. Not one over the other or anything like that, but mutually uplifting. And so we're going to first look at what you, the church, should expect of your leaders. That's where we're going to start today. So I'm talking, when I say leaders, I'm talking about our, our pastors, our elders, and here specifically for us in Rock Cave and in, in Montevideo, uh, I'm talking about our steering committee, okay, that our, we have a local steering committee that serves under the authority of our, our Rock Haven elder board to provide local kind of leadership and direction for us. And so, so I'm, that's who I'm talking about when I'm talking about leaders here this morning. So we're going to see these expectations in our passage of how a church's leaders ought to expect ought to serve, how the church ought to expect its leaders to serve. And then we're going to flip it around. We're going to look at, look at it the other way. We're going to look at what faithful leaders should then expect from uh, the congregation. And we'll see how the congregation is instructed to treat faithful church leadership. And so let's look first at the ways church leadership should be serving. This is what you guys should be expecting out of your leaders. Okay, I, I can already sense our guys who are on our steering committee getting a little uncomfortable. So if you don't know our steering committee, our steering committee includes Charlie Landmark, Cody Spay, and Dean Bourne, and then myself and Owen Gustafson, our elders who serve as representatives 
on that, that steering committee. So, and so at first read, when we first read through this passage, it may seem like this is a one-way passage, right? It may seem like it's only commanding the congregation how they should treat their leaders, okay? And that is a primary focus here. But implicit in this passage, too, are, are three ways that the leaders uh, should be serving, how they should be expected to serve the church. The, Paul places kind of three qualifiers in here of what it means to be serving and leading in a faithful way. Okay, so this is what a church should expect from its leaders. First, the church should expect its leaders to labor among you, to labor among you. So leaders of a church should work faithfully, should work diligently for the sake of the gospel. They should be putting in hard work towards towards uh, this end, for this very purpose. My daughter Krista and I were at the bank earlier this week, and uh, the lady that was helping us asked me, so are you employed? I said, well, I'm a pastor, so just the one day a week. Um, but so, you know, Everybody loves to make that joke. I don't think any, probably my grandpa more than anybody loves to rib me about that. that. But um, the reality is, is God faithfully calls people to serve as leaders in his church. As he faithfully raises up leaders, he instills in them this, this passion for the sake of knowing Jesus and for the sake of making Jesus known. Okay? And that passion is going to drive them to work hard in this direction, to work hard to see that Jesus is known, that he's worshipped, that he's followed and obeyed. Okay? But this, I'm not just talking about our paid pastoral staff. I'm talking about our, our volunteer leaders, our, our lay leaders as well. And so I want to give you a little glimpse. I want you to understand how these, these guys, specifically looking at our steering committee here in Monty, how these guys are working and serving you, how they're laboring among you. Okay, when we get together on a, a monthly basis, every time we get together, we divide our time into some key areas to help guide and focus our time. And so we, we always start off with, we dig into a, key, a passage of scripture together, and then we spend time discussing a a chapter of a book that we're reading together. And so, you know, you might be thinking, oh, great, they have a book club, wonderful. No, the reason we do that is because if we as leaders are going to be calling our people to be, to be growing, we need to be growing ourselves. And so this gives us accountability to make sure that we as a leadership team are growing first before we're then calling you guys to grow so that we're not calling you to do something that we're not doing ourselves. And so specifically, the book we're working through right now is helping us understand how does the gospel lead us to form and, and shape a, a, a culture of leadership at, in our uh, church right now. It's helping us understand what, how does the gospel inform how we lead uh, the church. And so that's where we're learning and growing right now together. And after we do that, we then move into a time of prayer where we pray for every one of you. And so right now, we, we, we're specifically, we take four or five individuals or families and we pray specifically for you as detailed as we can by name at every meeting. Some of you have probably gotten texts from me letting you know that, hey, we prayed for you this week. Okay, so we, we want to be in prayer and, and, and covering our, our people uh, in prayer. And then we also will pray for other people who we know might have other needs as well. And from there, we move into a time of focusing on our mission. We're talking about how are we making disciples? How are we leading our people closer to Jesus? What are we doing now and what do we need to be thinking about doing or what do we need to be doing? Okay, and then we'll end our time together talking about any other business of the church, okay, building stuff or other, you know, things like, like that. And before we switch from one topic to the next, we pause and we pray over that discussion so we can make sure our prayers or our meetings are infused with prayer. In, in demonstrating our dependence on God. Okay, but that's just our time together when we meet. Okay, outside of our meeting, these guys are also serving you in regular ways. They're leading youth group. They're leading worship. You saw two of them up here leading in worship. They're, Owen is helping on the preaching team. Okay, Dean is doing all kinds of other uh, things, helping with the building, counting, you know, the offering after uh, uh, the service helping in so many other ways during the week. But I, what I appreciate most about these guys, I want you to hear this, is what I appreciate most is that when you talk to these guys, they each have specific relationships in their lives that they're, they're looking to invest themselves into for the sake of helping people know the gospel, for the sake of helping people know and follow Jesus. 
That's what I so appreciate about our leadership team is they have this Jesus-focused life that they want to see people know and grow in Jesus. And so that's why I'm so grateful for them. And I want you to understand how these guys are laboring among you, how they're doing, doing this among you here. And so the second expectation, though, you should have from your leaders is that they actually lead you in the Lord. It says our ESV translation that we use here says, who are over you in the Lord. Okay, but the idea isn't, the idea here isn't that leaders rule over their people kind of like for their own advantage, for their own profit or anything like that. It's not about position. It's not about superiority or anything like that. This is about leaders getting low so that they can lift up the congregation. Okay? This is about leading a congregation in a specific direction, which is specifically towards Jesus. Okay? They're expected to lead in the Lord. And so that means the leaders within a church, they lead under God's authority and they lead with accountability to God, that they're going to have to give account to how we've been shepherding the people God has placed within Rock Haven. We're going to have to stand in account before God one day of how did we do that. And so they're supposed to be, we're supposed to be shepherding the flock toward, the, toward a specific direction, the, the greener pastures of knowing a deepening relationship with Jesus. Okay, a, a church whose leaders are more consumed with, with other things, whether it be uh, a building, you know, marketing schemes, image, things like that, politics, whatever it might be, is going to quickly become a church who is unfaithful and quickly become a church who then is unhealthy. Okay, so we, you should expect the leaders of your church to be leading you ever closer to Jesus. That's our primary role. Paul explains this another way in Colossians 1, verse 28. He says, Him we proclaim, he's talking about Jesus, Jesus we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Okay, God graciously and faithfully raises up leaders for the specific purpose of helping us grow in maturity toward Christ. And so as a congregation, you should expect your leaders to be doing this, to leading you towards Jesus. That should be the primary focus you see your leaders working on. You should be asking questions. Are they leading me deeper into God's word? Are they helping me understand my relationship with God more? Are they helping me see my life through the lens of the gospel more? Are they leading me in that direction? To do this, though, you have to understand that's going to mean challenging you to do things, to go places that may not be comfortable at times, that may be challenging to you. Okay, if we think back, we remember when God led Israel out of slavery in Egypt. He called Moses to, to lead them, right? And when they got out of slavery, they get into the wilderness, things got hard. When, when things got hard, what did Israel want to do? They wanted to go back. They, were, they complained and they grumbled. They wanted to go back into slavery in Egypt because that's what they knew. That's what they were comfortable with. They wanted to go back to what they knew. And so we have to understand that the, the, the role of our leaders is to challenge us to do what's hard, to take us where God wants us to go. And so we should expect that. We should expect to be challenged. We should expect our leaders to be faithfully leading us in that direction. And then third, the church should also expect that its leaders will admonish you. And so this word admonish includes both a sense of warning and a sense of instructing or teaching. And so it's both warning against you know, behaviors or beliefs that are contrary to God's word and also instructing you. How, do, how can I live a life that's pleasing to God? How can I live a life in obedience to God. And so for pastors and leaders to lead you in that deeper relationship with Jesus requires this admonishing. It's going to require at certain times to both warn and correct. You should expect that of us. I mean, you look around and we can see many, many pastors, many churches today who have abandoned this responsibility of admonishing their people to follow Jesus. They instead teach, you know, kind of through this lack of admonition that Whatever you believe, however you behave, anything is fine. Everything is fine. 
When a pastor or church abandons this responsibility of admonishing their people, they are basically saying that, that calling people to repent from sin, to turn from sin, and to grow in holiness, to grow in a faithful walk of following Jesus, that that somehow no longer matters. And so may that never be true of us at Rock Haven. For our leaders here, we have to faithfully carry out this responsibility for your good and for God's glory. This is what he's called us to do, even though it can be difficult at times. If you know me, there's this tendency in me that wants to be a people pleaser. Right? As a pastor, I've got to work against that. That's the idea of fearing God or fearing man. Who, who are you going to fear? And so we need to work against that so we can have difficult conversations that help us all move in that direction of faithfulness to God. And so we need to have this level, this role of admonishing as leaders, but we need to do it in love. We need to do it with grace. You should expect us not to be bullying our people into obedience, but loving and leading them into obedience. We need to say hard, thing, hard things, but we need to speak that truth in love, all for the sake of building up the church in Christ. And so the word that I would use to summarize all of this, of so what you should expect from your leaders, the one word I would use is faithfulness. It's faithfulness. You should expect your leaders to be leading faithfully, faithful to their calling, faithful to their families, faithful to obey God's word, faithful to be growing themselves if they're going to be calling you to grow. A healthy church, to be a healthy church, needs leaders who are faithful. Okay? And so that's what you should expect most of all from us and should hold us accountable to that. And so as the church's leaders faithfully serve a congregation, then our passage does primarily look at the expectations for the congregation side of this relationship. And this is what your leaders should expect from you as they are faithfully serving. And so again, our passage, it says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. And so three key things we see here are expected of the congregation in response to leaders who are serving faithfully. Respect, esteem them highly, and do this all in love. Okay, so we have to be clear first. This is not just a call to blindly follow and obey leaders who are serving selfishly, who are serving unfaithfully, who are harming the church. That's not what this is calling us to. What I see here in this passage is that we as a church should so highly love and cherish Jesus. We should so highly value the message of the gospel, of who Jesus is, and what he's done to save us from our sin, to redeem us from our sin through his life, death, and resurrection. We should hold that message up so highly. We should love that message so much that our love overflows into the respect and the esteem for those who are working to help us hold that message up. And so we see a natural connection between the two. We should so exalt Jesus in such a way that then we naturally will respect and lift up those leaders who are helping us do exactly that. Okay, so our love for Jesus naturally overflowing into love for the leaders and our, the love of our leaders for Jesus, so naturally overflowing that it, flow, it overflows into love for the people, the love for the church, so that it's this mutual relationship, this mutually beneficial building up of each other. If a church's biblically qualified leaders aren't faithfully serving in obedience to Jesus, trust will break down. And likewise, if the church isn't respecting and building up its leaders as they do faithfully serve, again, trust will break down. And whenever trust breaks down, the health of a church will disappear. It'll go right out the window. A mutually uplifting relationship between the church and its leaders is essential for a healthy church. And when this type of relationship exists, it allows us to keep the mission of making disciples, of helping people know Jesus and making Jesus known, it helps us keep that front and center. Because when trust breaks down and health disappears, 
Everything else, anything else is going to become the focus of the church other than the mission. When the church isn't healthy, anything but the true mission of the church is going to become the focus. But a mutually uplifting relationship, something we desperately need, is only possible through the gospel. The gospel is the only way to know the peace that the end of verse 13 talks about here. Jesus gave himself up in love at the cross in order to serve and build up, to build his church. Only when we look to and cling to Jesus because of what he's done for us will both parties, leaders and the church, be able to humbly submit ourselves to each other for the sake of building each other up. You see, apart from the gospel, we will only, all all of us will only ever look to build ourselves up. Apart from the gospel, we're just looking to, we're looking out for number one. We're just looking to build ourselves up. When church leaders drift from the gospel, they will begin to use the church to exalt themselves. And likewise, when the congregation begins to drift from the gospel, they will look to tearing down their pastor for the sake of building themselves up. Only in keeping Jesus central can we die to ourselves. Can we die to our own agendas? Can we lay down our selfish motives and live out this better way that Jesus has for us in his word? Okay? Our society today is rightly skeptical of authority and leadership in general. That means that we have an opportunity as a church to show them a kind of leadership relationship that doesn't seek its own selfish benefit like we see so often in society today but instead exists for the good of the entire church and the good of our community. That type of leadership relationship today is rare. It's rare. What we're talking about is something that could largely be very countercultural. Because we don't see it in, in government, we don't see it in business, we don't see it much in academia, and sadly we see it less and less within the church too. But to do this, we need to continually die to ourselves die to our own agendas, and keep looking to Jesus to foster this mutually uplifting relationship. Because that's what we need. That's what we need to be a a healthy church. And so I want to close, though, here on a personal note. Okay, I've been here just over a year and a half. And you can rest assured that the longer that I'm here, the more likely there are going to be things that I inevitably do as your pastor that are going to annoy you a little bit. Okay? It's kind of like when you're married, right? You still love the person, but the longer you're married, there are things that they do that are kind of annoying. I mean, you, Marie's got a list. Just ask her. You know, she'll, she's got a long list, I'm sure. <laughs> but you still love them, right? You still love them. But as you keep getting to know me, as, as I'm here longer, chances are there's going to be things that pop up that I do that aren't you don't like all that much or maybe slightly annoying. Maybe when I preach, you're going to think, oh, I wish you would move around the stage more. I wish you would use better illustrations or better stories or, you know, I wish you wouldn't say um so much when he talks or things like that. You know, I wish he, uh, you know, would do things this way. I wish he wouldn't do things this way. You know, I wish, I wish, whatever, you fill in, you fill in the blank. That in- inevitably is going to gonna come. We probably each have a long list of things we would love to see in our ideal pastor, in our ideal leader, right? I can guarantee you that my list is a lot longer than your list of all the ways I wish I was stronger as a pastor. I guarantee you. But I want you to hear me on this. Even though I'm sure you, if you haven't yet, you will come to understand and perceive in me different weaknesses I want you to know that in my time here, again, just over a year and a half, I have felt far more the weight of your love for me and my family than any weight of critical attitudes or opinions towards us. Your prayers and your constant support and encouragement of us and our family has been so appreciated. Okay, so thank you for that. You know, there's, there's so many times in 1 Thessalonians when, when Paul tells, writes to them and says, hey, you guys are doing great. Keep going. Keep doing that. Hey, that's what I want to tell you guys. You guys are, 
what we're talking about here, I want to thank you for the ways you guys have been living this passage out well. Thank you for that. And so I just want to encourage you, keep doing it. Selfishly, for my sake, right? Keep doing it. Keep showing that love and support to our, our leaders.